Welcome, I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you are listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom, as we welcome today The Lost Voice, with John Studi and Jacob Nelson. Welcome to The Lost Voice Radio program, where we seek to rediscover the lost voice of wisdom and philosophy in our culture, which first spoke to Socrates some 23, 2400 years ago. John Studi. Welcome. Thank you, Jacob, for inviting me over yet again. I see that. To the studio. To the, to the studio. Yeah, which coincidentally is actually my garage. Don't tell people that. Okay, it's, actually, it's not my garage. It's not in your garage. It's, it's, the, it's the Jake Cave. It's the Jake Cave, which is not past the interstate off on an off-road with barriers that say do not pass. Correct. And when you reach a certain point, the barriers don't come down and a cave opens up and you enter into it. Correct. Yes. This is accurate. This is accurate. None of those things happen. (laughs) Right. Well, boy, we have quite the show today, don't we? Oh, yeah. This week, and I think next week especially, is going to get a little intense. Uh, We're camping? Yeah, exactly. I didn't say, well, we're actually in the back. We're in the Jake Cave, not intense, but it will be intense next week. We can do this. (laughs) It's like 15 bucks to go buy a little kitty pop-up tent at a... Well, I, I have air mattresses, too. Oh, do you? So, oh, yeah. Yeah. I suppose, yeah. Do you still have all those? No. Oh. No. We had to buy a bunch of air mattresses for, you know, the listeners' sake. So they don't think we're just buying, buying, buying air dozens of air mattresses well, for fun. Well, we, we bought it because of the floods that we heard were coming with uh, uh, recent rains. Um, what happens after it snows, a big, you know, a big snow in, in Minnesota, we wanted to make sure that we had some sort of life raft to survive. The coming flood. None of that no, is true no, either, is it? True either. No. <laughs> I, I have absolutely no interest in expressing the truth today. Um, oh, just God. kidding, of course. No, those were all bought for one of our camp events. We needed yeah. beds for children. Yeah, we overbooked our camp, which is a great thing. Yeah, and, it was uh, awesome. That just meant we had to buy a bunch of air mattresses. So. Yeah, we're doing all right. There you go. Well, today we continue our exploration of the USCCB Intercultural Competencies Workshop. We are on Module 3, which may I point out that we have not had hardly any obligatory nonsense so far. And maybe that's because we have to explore so many things and help make sense out of things so that people can study things. Well, the obligatory nonsense is forthcoming. Ah. It's basically the whole show this this week. so. (laughs) So we're on the third module, and that module is about uh, developing intercultural skills, communication skills in pastoral settings, specifically between collectivist and individualist cultures, which we talked about a bit, I think it was last week or the week before. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to explore this a little bit. I've worked uh, a number of years in a highly intercultural setting in parish life, so I most certainly have some stories. I think some of the things the USCCB is putting out here are really good talking uh, points, uh, discussion starters. Um, some of it's good information or, or a good framework to put forward, and other things we'll talk about. We will have a discussion, and it will be fun, and it will be exciting. And I might throw my wallet, which I have a brand new wallet, by the way. It's leather. Check it out. Actually, I know. You showed me well, last week. It we is. About this last week, didn't yeah, we? you forgot your wallet it, in the Jake Cave, and you didn't actually end up throwing it last week, oh, like you said you would. I'll have to do it this week because it's and now it's, now it's worn in a little bit. It'll bounce okay. a little better, not not go through one of your walls. Yeah, I was gonna say, don't put a hole in my wall. I, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, no, this this last week has just been ridiculous. Uh, my, I've been have this terrible cold. Haven't been sleeping. Um, so basically, I can't remember anything. Perfect. I continually forget what I'm doing at any given moment. Would we consider that a day. grace and a mercy to the world? Yes. Okay. Because that means I don't get to accomplish anything, which, and since all my ends are evil, <laughs> I therefore cannot accomplish those dastardly items that I have stored in my mind. Right. And planned for all of humanity. Yes, yes. Anyway. But you implant those in your son's mind, much like uh, the movie Inception. Yes. So that they become his ideas. Which are actually th- your ideas. I actually think they were his ideas first. <laughs> so my, so Michael's doing Inception to you? He, he, he's got to be. He's got to be. I mean, I, I didn't th- start thinking the way that I did until Michael was born. He changed everything about me. 
I think maybe it's been through sleep deprivation because that's actually one of the a brainwashing tactic. That's true. Make somebody uh, be be completely deprived of sleep, yeah. and it weakens their will, and they'll they'll accept uh, other points of view or other ways of thinking or uh, right. they'll be fed information that just like alternative just, facts. Yeah, alternative facts. Uh, fun. Oh, very fun. So. Uh, John, I don't know if you have anything in particular you want to uh, lead us off with here. Um, I know a couple things later on down the road, but uh, to be honest, you uh, you probably do more show prep than I do. Sometimes. Sometimes. Um, you know, after reading through several, several of the modules here, you listeners who are going through this with us, um, I really want to encourage you to remember that there's a distinction or there's an important uh, application of knowing that there are differences between cultures yes. and that it's important to recognize those differences in order to effectively communicate between different social contexts, which you might not be used to. Right. But then there's also the objective norms, which are universal and applicable to all men. Mm. Uh, all men. And that's something we also need to keep in mind. I remember... A number of years ago, a friend of mine uh, was going to school for anthropology, and her and I were talking one day, and she uh, had said something along the lines of, they were studying some culture, and she said, that's, and that's, and that was just, uh, I thought that was just bad. And then she, she apologized profusely, she said, oh, no, no, I can't say that, I can't say that. As an archaeologist, as a scientist, I can't say that anything is, is, is worse or, or, or better, or <laughs> I can't say that a culture is, uh, is more or less good or evil than another. And I'm wow. thinking, what crap is that? I mean, number one, it's it's self-refuting because it's saying that our culture is the kind of culture, and you're making this judgment about our culture, that it can't judge other things. So you're making a judgment about our culture being not something that can actually judge others, which is all sorts of doublespeak sounding, but when it comes down to it, anybody who denies that we can actually make moral or, val- or uh, judgments of value is in themselves doing exactly that, making a, True. a judgment a judgment value. Um, and that itself is due to a rejection um, of a certain part of human nature, which is actually primarily our reason. Um, and this has a whole philosophical and hi- uh, historical background to the reason why we've rejected reason when it comes to uh, making moral decisions. Um, but long story short, uh, according to the contemporary model or the contemporary understanding is that all morality is boiled down to mores. And so it's not, no, that's not, it's not that song, you know, when you're, when the moon hits your eye, like a big pizza, that's a more. That's a more. Yeah, it's yeah. a more. It's not, that's not what I mean. That's love. It also that's sounds like thing. a city in uh, Lord of the Rings. A mo- more. It kind of does, yeah. yeah. It's a great one. But a more, Jake. Yeah. It's just more or less a, a, cult, a cultural custom. Okay. For instance, um, oh and I, I don't, I can't believe I'm going here, but this is my, oh uh, <laughs> I'm afraid. One of the things I remembered, okay, well, in Peru, there are two things which were uh, reverse of our uh, of our culture in terms of its mores, its customs. Uh-huh. Um, in the United States, you can chew gum. That's fine. And often people are thankful you're chewing gum because otherwise you would have the breath of death. Fair enough. Which is which is true, and frequently in my case, I had terrible health illnesses, especially in, in middle schools. <laughs> middle schools are worse. Uh, Don't ever do it if you can do it if you can avoid it, and become an adult with a health. Anyway, health anyway, anyway. anyway. Um, kidding. Uh, so chewing gum here in the United States, largely it's fine unless you're talking to somebody doing a public presentation, something that's specifically interrupting an end that you're trying to bring about. Um, but in Peru, chewing gum is one of the worst things you can do because they think you just look like an absolute moron. You, they think you look like a cow chewing its cud and that you're reducing your uh, human dignity down to that of a, a farm animal. Conversely, in Peru, uh, passing gas is of no consequence. <laughs> um, which, in, in the United States here, I mean, we'll, we'll joke about those things, but ultimately it's something that you don't do in polite company. You don't do it in very comfortable company. In fact, you're often very embarrassed. No, you move to the other side of the room before it uh, dissipates in the room. So that so nobody that, knows that it's you. Well, exactly. Yeah. It's just a little, a little bomb and leave, right? Right. So, uh, but in Peru, no, it just sounds like a, 
Is this really where we're going? <laughs> the radio ride, show. People blowing their horns everywhere. Um, but it's just fascinating because that, 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 that here in the United States, that would never pass. Um, whereas uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. I know, right? Whereas in Peru, it was no big deal. So those things, I mean, that's you know, chewing gum isn't inherently or intrinsically sinful. Um, and whether or not you're violating some sort of moral norm, a real moral norm, um, and, and committing a wrong deed does depend on your culture in those contexts. On the other hand, a moral morality is something that's a bit different. We'll talk about that in just a little bit here. Um, but overall, what I'm saying is that I want our listeners to understand that there's a difference between saying, yeah, there's, there are, are different approaches to uh, interacting with one another that each culture has, and without understanding those different approaches, it's going to be hard to communicate. But there are ways of communicating, there are ways of relating, there are um, ideas and customs that are more or less good or evil um, than others. And we'll talk about that again. In, in yeah, and I think, you know, one thing that you uh, brought up is that there are, in fact, differences between cultures. And in general, we just recognize the difference for what it is. Yes. Uh, and it, it's something that ought to inform our ability to speak across cultural barriers and cultural lines. However, we can't equate differences with merely being good. Mm-hmm. Not every difference is a good difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not every value in each culture is good. Uh, it's good insofar as the culture uh, sees an apparent good or an alleged good in it. Uh, and it's judged as the culture is good, but that doesn't mean the value is good. Right. The American culture highly, highly values artificial contraception yes. because the culture sees an apparent good in it. It's an apparent good, not a real good. And that value is not good. And so it's something that we can't just look at. You know, if we had somebody from, uh, I don't know, Vatican City come in, you know, in, in Vatican City, you know, they promulgated Humana Vitae. They promulgated so many other uh, documents uh, in reference to things like contraception. If, you know, Pope Emeritus Benedict came, I would hope he wouldn't look at our culture and say, well, you know, I, I value natural family planning and the Americans, well, they value artificial contraception. So, you know, it's a difference and, you know, we'll just live and let live and it's all good. That's bull crap. It is. We, the difference needs to be recognized uh, and then it needs to be judged so that we can appropriately communicate across cultural lines, mm-hmm. but not for the sake of communication as an end. The communication has to be oriented towards something, and that something would be charity. And so if I recognize a difference, and I don't speak in charity if that difference is bad, and try and correct that in the, the individual or maybe a small uh, microculture or macroculture, um, if I do nothing, even though I recognize it's bad, then then I'm in some ways as guilty as those who value the evil thing. Mm-hmm. And so the differences that we see ought to be first recognized, then assessed and judged as to whether or not they're good, bad, or neutral. Because not every value has a moral implication to it. Like you said, chewing gum, there's no moral implication to chewing gum. Unless you're chewing gum during mass or something, but that brings in a different circumstance yep. and intention. Objectively, there's no morality associated with chewing gum. But so we assess and we judge whether it's good, bad, or neutral, and then we have to communicate why that thing is good, bad, or neutral. If we just leave it at, well, it is what it is, live and let live, we're not really actively working in the Lord's vineyard. We're not really working in a pastoral setting. And so we need to get over the fear of being called a bigot or being called racist or being called whatever else so you know what there are things in your culture john is as a redhead as a ginger there are good things in your culture there are also bad things like you try to steal souls and i've been very successful at that i know I, I feel dead and empty every time around you well good that's how i'm going for it jake because if you feel dead and empty on the inside that means you can be alive to christ You've um, emptied yourself, you've emptied your cup so you can receive his grace. I thought you were just trying to make me in your image. They can only be one me, Jake. <laughs> that is for sure. Stop endeavoring to such lofty heights. 
That is absolutely the case, that there is only one you. What's the saying, Isaiah? Don't, uh, don't, re- don't reach to things that are too high for you or something like that. I think it's Isaiah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yes, actually, that's... I, I completely agree. What we're trying to do in every situation we're trying to communicate to one another, but by the very nature of it, is going to be something that is uh, oriented towards truth, and truth and charity are um, intrinsically bound together. Um, and the import, one of the important things about understanding another person's culture, even if it's somebody within your own broader culture, for instance, um, I could have a dialogue with somebody who I'm, I'm, a, I'm, cons- I'm politically conservative. Um, I mean, uh, Orthodox Catholic, as, as far as I'm... <gasps> I can't believe you would admit that. I know, on air, too. The, do- the dogma speaks loudly from within me, right? <laughs> Oh man, that's that was another awful. Yes, it was. I couldn't even believe that. Um, and and how how is there a religious test for political office nowadays? I mean, it's just. Oh, yeah. anyway, moving on. Wow. So, but the point is, I could I could actually have a conversation with somebody across the aisle, but I would have to speak their language and right. uh, find that common point of agreement in order to start moving forward at all. Um, in fact, I've had successful conversations with people about things like abortion and, and, contrac- and, uh, and, and gay marriage, uh, as in, you know, one sense of it being successful is that both parties left with a greater appreciation and understanding of the other. You know, sometimes if you can't get agreement, I'm, I'm more than happy with clarity. Because yeah. at the very least, you're uh, you're showing goodwill towards your neighbor, and I've had plenty of conversations with people on that. Well, and with clarity, there's at least some desire for truth, mm-hmm. even if it's uh, corrupted truth. It, an authentic pursuit of clarity means that that soul is open to discovering what is true, mm-hmm. and so that's a great place to start in a conversation. And it's also, in a way, just uh, being open to discover the truth about the other, right? Instead of um, uh, the demagoguery that we see where we'll paint the other side as demonic or completely wicked or um, hating a certain people of a certain race or having some sort of malicious motive for the worldview. Um, being able to find that clarity and be open to that kind of conversation is the one of the best ways you can... Uh, it's probably the best way that you can actually start approaching um, some of the bigger issues that we have going on right now. Um, but in either case, whether I've been able to clear up something, clear up my worldview, or, or understand somebody else's view better, or if I've been able to convince somebody else of something, or vice versa, um, it always started off with us finding a place of agreement. Um, like when my, with my conversation with my kids about gay marriage, we'll sit down, we'll talk about what does good mean, yeah, and, and how do we figure this out. And all I do is ask them questions, and often by the end of the conversation, I think last year had like a 90% conversion rate, so to speak, where they changed their mind at the end of the conversation. Yeah. But uh, with the others who didn't change their mind, at the end they said, that's a lot more reasonable than I'd like it to be. <laughs> Which I think is hilarious. <laughs> um, but in, either way, it, you're right. We have to find uh, those those modes of communication. We have to understand why those why people believe what they believe. Right. Um, and and as, start as, from there. as a side note, I would like to just, you know, because I work, you know, in, in the church, and sometimes we got to build ourselves up a little bit to keep going. I would like to take just a little, little Do tiny it. bit of Do credit it. for your uh, affinity for Socratic dialogue with youth. It certainly did help. Yeah, <laughs> it did help. The way that I was raised with apologetics and taught was: somebody brings up a point, you bring up a counterpoint, and you call them evil for not believing you. Um, that seems reasonable. It does <laughs> seem reasonable. Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but basically, the way that I did apologetics when I was younger. Um, and it was because this is what was modeled to me, was that you have your point of view, and then you go back and you find as much support as you can for it, and then you bury the other person in this mountain of evidence <laughs> to the point where they either where they have to defend all these different points or refute all of them, but they just can't because there's just so much they couldn't possibly lift that heap that you've piled on top of their shoulders, and you can walk away thinking you've, you've come up with a victory. But in reality, what happens with that approach is you get people more mired in their own... Uh, uh, Worldview, or they're more fortified in what they perceive to be true, um, and no dialogue is had on either side. Right. The Socratic method's much, much better. Yes. I agree. Good. Yeah. Maybe we'll, we should do a series on how to do a Socratic dialogue. That would be wonderful. Maybe that'll come right after we're done with the Intercultural Competencies Workshop. Deal. Deal. And it'll be a great follow-up, too, to give people some solid principles and practical application to 
understanding how to apply some of these tactics. Yes, I am actually teaching the art of rhetoric right now to high schoolers at a homeschool co-op. And my two rules are as follows. Define your terms and ask good questions. That's pretty much the summation of Socratic dialogue. So I guess we don't need to do a series now. All right. You're all, you're welcome, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll do that after the Intercultural Competencies Workshop. So one of the things this week is really looking at the difference between collectivist and individualist cultures and exploring how to communicate across that divide. And, and I think this is one of those cases where the USCCB really puts in uh, a good distinction for us to understand. And I think as we noted in last week, these uh, A versus B um, words, titles, definitions, whatever. Polarized. Pol- yeah, they're, they're designed to be polarized, but no culture perfectly fits on one end of the spectrum or the other. They're somewhere in between, tending to one or the other. Uh, and so collectivist versus individualist is really, I think, a good one. Uh, and we're going to explore both some of the good things in in this dialogue and some of the difficult things or even bad things in this dialogue so that we can be more effective. Because, again, this whole idea of intercultural communication is not to break down political, financial, whatever kind of barriers. That's liberation theology, and that's been condemned over and over again. (laughs) Uh, We're not working to liberate one another from simply worldly things. We are working to liberate people from their sin by bringing them the good news of Jesus Christ. And so our communication has to be oriented towards the gospel. Otherwise, we just become another NGO. We're no better than the Red Cross, United Way, Peace Corps, whatever else. Because we're just going to be oriented towards the material goods of the people around us, which that needs to be met as well. Right. But if we're not doing it with an orientation towards the gospel and fraternal charity, uh, then we're no longer the Catholic Church or the Catholic Red Cross or something. I don't know. Or the yellow banner with the people crest. That would be our that would be our title. Kind of like the Red Cross as a flag. Yeah. But the, the Vatican flag has Or the, the Papal Crest. Or the Papal Crest. Yeah. Okay. That sounds horrible. Yeah. It's a horrible organization name. Yeah, it really is. It sounds like crusty and gross. Yeah. I don't know why you came up with that. I was just trying to think of a clever name that people could catch on to. I might this just, could be a thing. I might replace it with Justin. That's fine. I'm kidding. Which one? Justin Nelson? Justin's image? <laughs> Zimich. Be a melding of you two. <laughs> No, I could never replace you, Studi. Ah, you're the best co-host I've ever had. Why? Thank you, Jacob. So, and also the worst, incidentally. No, because Justin's filled in before. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry, Justin. Love you, Justin. All right. So the content of face is um, one of the ways that the USCCB has chosen to look at uh, individualist versus collectivist cultures. And the content of face is really looking at what makes up the the face of a culture. So when we look at it, we know certain things about it. Um, And they they cite Stella Ting Toomey, um, who's a researcher in the field. Uh, And Toomey names three predominant values that shape the face of a group and are particularly important. And those three things are autonomy, morality, and competence. And so we're going to spend a good amount of time on these three things, and then we're going to... Except for the last, because our knowledge base on that topic is very lacking. Competence? <laughs> yes. Yeah. We can do apophatic competence. <laughs> we can teach people what competence is by... Teaching what is not. What it is not. Yeah. And we have a lot of experience on at being incompetent. Or at least that's what people tell us. I... T- that doesn't get told to me anymore. Oh. Congratulations, Jake, on the yeah. new job, by the way. <laughs> yeah, excellent, thank excellent you. work. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, autonomy, morality, and competence. Um, autonomy. Uh, the definition the, the USCCB gives is that my group is self sufficient and does not need to be tutored or guided by other groups. We do not want to be treated as dependent children. 
And so I, I think this is probably a, a fair definition for autonomy, um, that a group wants to be distinct from other groups, and, and that follows uh, from the uh, six transcendental properties of being, that each thing is an individual thing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, not we as individuals, no matter how collectivist our culture is, we still demand as human persons to be recognized as an individual, not just a cog in the machine or not just um, a worker for the state. Um, we still desire autonomy, and that's reflected in our culture too, and, and different cultural groups want to be recognized as individual groups. Um, and so, you know, in America we see an ever-growing uh, increase of uh, various Latino cultures, African cultures, Asian cultures, uh, and it would not be a good thing for us to say, well, they're all the same. They're just all immigrants. Sure. Because there's very distinct things that make up each group, and so to recognize the autonomy of each group is important. Um, but I think autonomy taken too far is bad because then you get uh, groups pitted against groups because they're so uh, set on or bent on uh, being completely self-sufficient. And I don't think that's healthy in, in a mm. society or in a culture. There needs to be some kind of camaraderie regardless of cultural background. Right. Well, I think that, again, it, was it last week or the week before? Um, one of the distinctives for me of a good, a good philosophy is uh, one which seeks to balance the contraries that we find, the one and the many, the uh, being and nothingness, um, those kind of those kind of aspects of reality, uh, change and in, 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 uh, similarity, and when it comes to cultures, um, one thing that we uh, notice is, is, is that we have exactly that we have a, a principle of, of difference between all different cultures, but we also have a principle of similarity, and it's that principle of similarity where we will find that uh, that common bridge uh, to actually cross that the communication barrier that might exist between cultures. Um, we, at the very least, share with every other culture in the world the fact that we're all rational animals, that we understand language, that we see meaning, that we seek after beauty, uh, beauty truth, and goodness. Um, and this is something that we can all connect to. Um, and that can even help cross communication barriers by any formal education. I remember seeing a movie when I was younger about uh, the old American West when um, uh, there was still all this westward expan- expansion, and there was a boy who had just happened to, uh, an American boy, who had happened to stum- stumble upon um, a uh, Mexican boy who was speaking Spanish, and the two never even heard, heard each other's languages before, um, English and, and Spanish. Yeah, yeah. And immediately they started communicating what their language, or what words or what sounds their language used in order to denote the same intention. And so they started talking about Mesa, and table. They started talking about silla and chair. They started talking about us, uh, um, soul and uh, and the sun, um, and all the others. These other words, which they had a common understanding of in terms of their uh, apprehension of the, the being of the thing, but it was the communication in terms of the words that was different. But it was through the fact that they were rational animals that they were starting. They were very easily able to start bridging the gap of communication. And so we need to unite. Uh, that in the fact that we do have one common human essence, which gives us a common human characteristic and behavior, mm-hmm. um, but that doesn't. But, but at the same time, it's good for us to keep uh, the diversity of uh, different cultural cultural norms and expressions and um, modes of communication, communication, which offer a different expression or uh, angle on that human nature. One point of clarification, because I'm just curious and I, I just like to pick on you a little bit sometimes if we all share the same essence are we just all one being we are just all one being <laughs> accusing you of being a bear yes. um, no no every uh, there is no uh, common universal essence that exists kind of like out there that we're participating in yeah but every essence is individual right um, and so yeah. there's a distinction between um, ends commune and uh, s and uh, ends and so ends commune is the the common being um which is the uh, understanding that there are these, there's a, there is a diversity of reality out there. Correct? Right. Yeah. Um, and then ends, of course, just an individual being. And essence is the expression of being. And then the individualizing factor is actually on the material side. So there you go. We're all different. That's why you're the philosopher and I'm the theologian. I pretend. I just use a lot of words. 
I didn't understand anything really you just said to me. <laughs> and then hopefully nobody. <laughs> well, that's the point of philosophy. <laughs> At least, it's, at least that's the impression you get if you read Kant. Oh my at god! At least modern philosophy. Yeah, modern philosophy. It's just um, like obfuscation. One thing about uh, autonomy that I would like to point out is in my last job, I worked a lot with multiple cultures all at once, and since this workshop is oriented towards uh, ministry and working in the church, I think practical application here is important. At my last parish, there was a lot of talk about working with individual cultures, which I think is really important because we need to recognize that different cultures have different needs. But then there was a disconnect because there was a lot of talk about wanting one parish and uniting the parish. And nobody in my estimation, really understood how to do that. And nobody would take my advice, even though I saw it work at places like Extreme Faith Camp. And so, if you look at the life of a parish, the one thing that all people in the parish do in common is celebrate the Mass. Mm -hmm. Not every person has a child in faith formation not everybody's going to do Bible study. Not everybody's going to go to the parish school. And you could go down the list. But everybody goes to Mass, or at least they should. But that's the reason why we have parishes in the first place, is the Mass. That is the primary mission of each church, of each parish. And so if we want to unite cultures, if we want to bridge the boundaries that different cultures uh, put up, it has to be done at the centermost part of our faith, which is the Mass. And if we strip away all of the nonsense that has gone on in liturgical mm. works of the last 60 years, we would understand what the Church actually desired at Vatican II. In one of those things, one of those principles is that Latin is to be preserved. And even in seminaries, it is said in the, the documents revolving ordination and preparation for ordination that uh, Latin must be provided for for the priest to be ordained. Every priest should know at least enough Latin to celebrate Mass. And that's largely been stripped away in the last 60 years and that's caused us to go too far in the way of autonomy. Because now what we have are individual churches, or let's say individual ecclesial communities within a parish. And so you have the Spanish Mass, you have the English Mass, you have the Swahili Mass, all this stuff. And most certainly there are times and places where that's very good. But if you're really looking at uniting a parish... You can do so without getting rid of meeting the need of individual cultures. But in the sake of unity, we need to get back to praying the universal language of the church. And I saw this work time and time again with our young people. John, you saw it at Extreme Faith Camp too. That, you know, the language, the primary language of, of Latino youth might be English, but their language of prayer at home is Spanish. Mm -hmm. So even though they might be more proficient in English, they don't know the Hail Mary in English. They know it in Spanish. Yep. And so what did we do? We prayed the rosary in Latin. And we prayed it in Spanish. We prayed it in English. And everybody's favorite was in Latin because we're united in a common language that none of us know. <laughs> and we can learn and grow in that together. And it truly did unite people. But that idea was not listened to when I sought to make that happen. That's difficult, isn't it? It is. It gets you. So am I being a good philosopher? I'm looking at the two extremes of full autonomy and uh, full and complete unity. And so on the autonomous side, you have all these individual cultures within a parish, and they don't communicate. On the other side, you have uh, full unity um, in, in the negative sense where um, you're just trying to make everybody the same and not recognizing the fact that different cultures have different needs. 
What I'm saying is that every parish needs to look at the various needs of the cultures represented, but bring them together in the unity of the Mass. Is that a fair plan? I, I think that is a beautifully fair plan, um, and it makes a ton of sense to me. And that's where um, we talk about that letter to Diognetus that we mentioned last time. It's the, the yeah. early, early church, and it was that same quote where straight Christians are are at home in every land, but we're strangers in every other every other person's homeland. Yeah. Um, and it's because we are, in essence, not united to any particular culture, um, because the Catholic faith can be is compatible just about every everything good in every, any culture, um, and it's through language that culture is very often expressed and uh, that ideas are often expressed. Right. And so, if we're looking for a universal way of expressing the church's culture that's common to all. Uh, all members of it, particularly in the West, with the Latin right, going to something like Latin, which would be a common foundation for all the different languages, primary languages, French, Spanish, English, uh, right. and, and so on. I mean, Portuguese. Portuguese. I mean, how beautiful and wonderful would it be to have Latin be the universal and common language for all of us? Um, and I think that would be something that could certainly help unite, uh, unite the various cultures and, and uh, linguistic differences into unity with one another. Um, plus, it'll make kids better at their SATs and ACTs. Latin's a wonderful language. It is, yeah. actually. Yeah. It's true. Uh, so, number two, morality. Do you want to you wanna start this one? Sure, except I'm going to make <laughs> one, 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 little, one last note on autonomy. Go here. for it. So, if you, if you have your guidebook, or if you're on the website looking at the different modules... The definition for autonomy is my group is self-sufficient and does not need to be tutored or guided by other groups. We do not want to be treated as dependent children. While I certainly think that last sentence is true, no person, no society wants to be treated as a child in a, in a way that's disrespectful or, or call into question their competence and intelligence and, and uh, stature. I think that it's a foolish thing to say that my group is self-sufficient and does not need to be tutored by oh, or guided by groups. This is a good point. I see um, where you're going with this. Yeah, because as we were saying, we have to have that element, that common element of unity. And because different cultural groups will express uh, some aspects or some of uh, the natural law in a way that's better or worse than other cultures, um, just the way this is the way human nature, following human nature is is that uh, when we encounter something in another culture that more perfectly reflects God's intention for our nature and more perfectly brings about the common good for our community, then we ought to be tutored by that group. Um, for instance, I think that the United States, the culture that we have in our, in, our, in our nation, could certainly learn something from Korea with respect to our uh, uh, relationship to elders. Oh, for sure. And our relationship to chastity. What's really fascinating about South Korea is that while it's primarily a, um, I think it's primarily a Confucius culture, not a Christian culture, um, their emphasis and their valuing of uh, of chastity and um, preserving the dignity of, of human of human beings through not objectifying them or as uh, sexual objects vastly uh, is vastly superior to the way that we operate in the United States. Um, yeah, absolutely. You don't see any nudity or sex scenes on South Korean TV. And you would know because you watch I all kinds of Korean. I watch a tremendous Korean. amount of South Korean TV. <laughs> but here in the United States, it's like you got a PG-13 show and it's like two teenagers getting together and now like the girl's topless in her bra and they're making out. Yeah. This is ridiculous. Yeah. How, how, does, it even, how does it pass any censorship board? And, and we're, all we're doing is reducing not only somebody who's you probably representing a, you know, a teenage girl or right. a teenage boy. Hopefully. Um, hopefully. Uh, to a, a, a sexual object. Yeah. Um, we are, uh, as, a, as a culture, saying that this is just the norm that people do, that kids just should take off their clothes and start going at it like rabbits right. or whatever. Um, but in South Korea, they have a much stronger um, emphasis on uh, yeah. on treating a person with dignity, and that and that goes with especially with things like like I said, elders and respecting authority. And, and life, actually, so. Netflix is just producing a cartoon. I don't know if you saw this. Uh -huh. Netflix is producing a cartoon aimed at teenagers, uh, and it completely seeks to normalize deviant sexual behavior. Huh. 
it's like it's so bad. So I'm. I'm yeah. canceling Netflix. And like, that's the other thing, too. It's yeah. so bad. My wife and I don't even use Netflix anymore. And that's actually one of the other things is that American TV, and this drives me with the wall, it's tr- it, it, attempts at, it attempts to uh, uh, engineer the culture. Right. Through uh, language, through uh, sub- subtle coercion, or maybe not so subtle coercion. Rather, than, normalizing rather than reflect the culture. Rather than reflect the culture or reflect the virtues of the culture. Um, things that ought to be uh, ought to be considered something to strive for. Yeah. Um, whereas in the United States, the only value that seems to be anyway uh, valued is tolerance, but a very, very corrupted understanding of tolerance. And that's such a stupid thing to value. I tolerate you. It means that I actually hate you, but I'm just putting up with you. That's such a stupid value. To have. I know it's insane. Uh. Anyway, so long story short, we should value our autonomy insofar as we need to, as a culture, be able to make our own decisions and, and guide ourselves. Um, but when we encounter some another culture that outpaces us in charity or in, in justice or, or prudence or chastity, we need to imitate them because that's a good thing. Yeah. Anyway. So, anyway, morality. Oh, yeah. This one's fun. Oh, yeah. Um, by the way, can I just throw something in there? Have you ever heard of the term doturd? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, North Korea. <laughs> Thank you, Kim Jong Un. Un. Un, for telling us more of our English language. That yeah, was great. I mean, <laughs> oh, no, the, the way a, that they What a great them. insult. Well, you'll see that in South Korean TV, even that what they do with subtitles is that they'll they'll translate a word. Yeah. And it's just this really bizarre word in English, and I don't know why they do that, but. It's fun. Anyway. But morality. All right. So this is another uh, face of the group. And now face here is is how we're reading um, another culture. This is how we're reading uh, how they communicate and operate within their own um, individual subgroups. Um, And the, uh, you know, not going to lie, this definition of morality is pretty horrible. It's not good. It's it's, uh, um, almost unforgivable. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So it says, my group is likable, <laughs> reliable, approachable, and deserves to be included in activities and events. We live by certain values that are good and important. This is like what you tell a bunch of second graders or like what second yeah. graders say that they want about with their lives. Like, we all want to be included. Well, yeah, but how in the world is wait, that? Wait, wait, wait. Did you really just reference second graders? Yes. When we just got done talking about how cultures don't want to be treated as children? Yes. Okay, go on. Okay, which, <laughs> hey, watch this, Jake. You ready for a transition? Yes, I Studi- am. One of Studio's like legendary, out of the blue, wow, that actually fits the random thing you just said transition. Is it like a bridge to nowhere? It is actually a bridge to nowhere. Okay. In fact, the nowhere is a large cliff that goes down. Perfect. Feet. Anyway, um... <clears throat> It's like a, the kindergartners or, or second graders. Um, the, they're the ones who want to be approachable and likable and reliable. I mean, those are all good things, um, except when your likability makes it so that uh, you are always falling away from the truth. You're always, you're, you're, your back is always willing to, to bend over um, to, uh, to accommodate anybody. Your uh, worldview changes according to who you're with and everything. Um, and a lot of what we what we're seeing here in this context is that a society doesn't have actual values that they hold to other than they want to be likable and reliable and approachable. I mean, that's that's crazy. And I, and I think that it's it's childish, a childish way of thinking. And this is something that has really infiltrated our culture. Yeah. Because what do we do? Right, right, right now, Michael is two years old, and he's. Something. I'm, I'm going to take a little nap while you go on a rant because. No, actually. Oh, no, I got to find my wallet. Okay. I'm going <laughs> so, to listen right intently, but you just you just go. I need to go. I'm going to go. Okay. Treat, treat this like a theological wheel of destruction. All moment. right. Go. go. Okay, go. <gasps> so, I have a two year old son, Michael. He is a toddler, which is normally what happens at two years old. <laughs> and he has been 
crazy. He likes to get a rise out of people. He always tells his mom, no, 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 mommy. Go away, mommy. And he says the same thing that me or his milk or his dog. Um, all these situations, he, he's, he's trying to get a rise out of somebody. And so what do we do when he if he, if he says those kind of things, if he bites us, if he uh, kicks us, if he, if he throws something? Um, will I say something like, Michael, how would it feel if you did this? Or do you like it when this kid at daycare bites you? Or anything like that. And then he always says, no, I don't like it when, it, but when this kid bites me. Um, and that's a good thing. That's great, because that's how a child understands ethical behavior. How he stands, understands norms, is he needs to be able to fit into the group. He needs to understand that he, that he uh, has to emphasize. He needs to think about, how will this make me feel? And he bases it entirely on his feelings and his own social standing. But the problem is we stay right there and we keep all of our moral decision-making right in the field of how do we feel. And the fact that this book is saying that morality is about being likable and approachable and uh, agreeable and, or whatever... Um, just shows that even the definitions that we're using now reflect an irrational approach to moral conduct. And this is an absolute tragedy, Jacob. It's childish. That is a tragedy. You know what else is a tragedy? Through that entire rant, you never threw your wallet. There you go. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, waiting for the cue. This <laughs> um... This is also in line with the misunderstanding of freedom and conscience. Um, there's this idea that our conscience is the final arbiter of morality. And St. Thomas even argues that uh, even if we have an erring conscience, we have an obligation to follow it. But the presupposition with our erring conscience is that we have sought to form it and to form it well. Uh, and so I recently ran into a graduate from good old St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, master's in theology, and she said this exact thing, that we have our consciences to tell us right and wrong, and we have to have an informed conscience, which is true. All of that is true. But you know what she cited for proper formation of the conscience? I want to know who this is later. <laughs> But we'll talk. <laughs> New York Times and Washington Post. These are the things forming our conscience? No! That is exactly the opposite of how we have to form our conscience. And so that, you know... Maybe apathetic formation. Yeah. You know, don't do this. <laughs> right. Um, and so morality is really rooted in what I like to call participatory theonomy. It's the free participation in the law of God. And even the cultures that might not have sent to the existence of, of the known triune God, sure. uh, we have the ability to assent and participate in other forms of law that the divine legislator has given, such as natural law. That's written on every human heart. We have the ability to participate in that freely. But because we simply sit and absorb the garbage in our culture instead of seeking to form our conscience, we just kind of by way of osmosis, accept the garbage into our conscience and say, well, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And because my conscience says so, then it must be fine. And that's not at all what Thomas was saying, and it's not at all what we should understand morality to be. Mm. It should be our free choice to enter into that which what we know is true, good, and beautiful. To freely participate in God's creation through the divine and eternal laws, but also through the natural law and proper human law. Freedom in conscience is not just a free-for-all. It's not a license. And this uh, definition of morality, I think, very much flies in the face of true morality. That idea of participatory theonomy is not equitable with we live by certain values that are good and important. Because not every value in a human culture is good or important. <laughs> Some of them are inconsequential, like chewing gum. That's not important. Who cares? Not everything is good in a culture. As we mentioned earlier, the culture of death and artificial contraception and abortion in America is not a good value to have. And we can't accept it as such. Otherwise, we are admitting that morality is equitable with license, doing whatever we please, 
not with God's law. Mm-hmm. And so this, it's important that we understand that different cultures might express morality differently in some ways. You know, the, the Latino culture might look at natural family planning and implement it in a different way from an Anglo culture. That's fine. Or you can look at the, the, the example I gave earlier of the Peruvian culture versus the American culture. Yeah. Where in, in the United States, we uh, don't pass gas in, in a polite company because, well, it's not polite, it's rude. It violates some sort of uh, spirit of unity and common bond. Right. Um, and in uh, Peru, chewing gum does exactly that. It violates some sort of uh, norm of um, unity and common bond between people. And so the value is that you want to make sure that you're not being rude to others. Right. Which is a good thing. That's you a good thing. You don't want to be offensive. Right. Um, but how but, it's expressed is different. Yes, but it's expressed. And that's okay. Um, and that's something to be accepted and, and worked with. But we can't simply equate morality with choosing whatever we please. That was the problem Adam and Eve entered into. Mm -hmm. They decided for themselves for the first time what was good and evil, and they ate from the tree. Right. It's a a sin of making yourself God, which I can't really imagine much more uh, more, more of a grave sin than that. Yeah. Um, And, you know, bringing it back around to the actual definition here, it's just, it's bizarre that anybody trained in theology would offer this as a... (laughs) I'm sorry to be straightforward about this, but offer this as, a, as anything that resembles a Catholic definition of morality. This is going to lead people astray if they don't know what they're talking about. Right. I mean, saying that morality is about being likable, that means you're going to bend on your uh, bend on your on the convictions, on your of, the convictions faith. of the faith. Uh, being and that's that's what people argue. Really? Okay. So I've been having conversations. Oh, here we go. Uh, I've been having conversations with kids at church and one thing i'm noticing is that practically speaking everybody who has an objection to the faith as a teen right now it's almost always related to matters of sexuality yeah almost nobody says you know i just don't believe in the real presence i think that uh, that the uh, lutheran doctrine of uh, consubstantiation is much more or companation is much more reasonable than transubstantiation of the catholic faith or they they won't say that i'm sorry i believe in the uh um, I believe in the uh, uh, middle knowledge understanding of God's providence rather than um, saying that God has a uh, that, that, God, that God actually is, is the arbiter of all things that, uh, that that occur I mean we don't see those kind of things we don't see those doctrinal and dogmatic speak, so to speak um, objections we see simply the objections to morality and uh, I, I know s- there's so many Catholics and this Father James Martin guy sorry to call him <laughs> on but Lord in heaven, help him. I mean this. Like, yeah. It's a real oh, yeah. prayer. He, yeah. he is leading people to serious sin. And Bishop McElroy from San Diego. I haven't not, read what not, he's reading. Not to name names. That's even worse. We name names. But we name names because... He's talking about those who attack Father Martin are a cancer in the church. That's dumb as... <laughs> things that are dumb. Because Okay. I want to do a whole show on him sometime on some of his arguments sometime because he and doesn't. Father Martin. Father Martin. He doesn't understand natural law. No. Nope. He doesn't understand the scriptures. Uh uh-uh. He doesn't understand the church teaching. What does he say? He says uh, uh, the church, the can, the uh, Catholic Church in the catechisms needs to change, needs to change the wording for uh, uh, people with homosexual inclinations from intrinsic from homosexual uh, desires being in, uh, intrinsically disordered to being uh, intrinsically differently ordered. <laughs> and it's sinking it's like wait hold on a second Father Martin do you know why it says disordered if you did if you did then he wouldn't object to this but you know what his reason for it is it's because, because it makes people feel offended or it hurts their feelings yeah truth hurts your feelings it always does when you're living in sin it's true um, I had this conversation with a kid just the other day is that by the end of the year as a ninth grader I guarantee you um, that after hearing all the apologetics and defense of the faith the only reason why you're going to have an objection is because you're defending a sin yeah. Um, and then he came up with this ridiculous objection saying, oh, science says X, Y, and Z. And it's like, that, uh, the science says that there's always an objection. I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Anyway, moving on. See, I, would, I would pull out then that um, philosophy and metaphysics are sciences as well, and they would argue that point. Yes, exactly. Uh, we do- I talked about that a little bit that way. Anyway, so, yeah, Father James Martin, he's, he's been pushing uh, a change in Catholic social teaching with regards to how we approach um, homosexual... Uh, also, one of the things he said... Couples. Is that um, because a group doesn't accept the teaching, yes. it doesn't have the power of uh, infallibility, it doesn't have the power of doctrine, all well, that's ridiculous, because then, you know, 
the church becomes simply democratic, and the church is not a democracy. So we in the West need to just get over that. Yes. We do need to finish up. We have five minutes left to do competency, which works because we are incompetent in everything we do. So this should go relatively quickly. My group has resources, achievements, and prized values. These need to be acknowledged and respected by other groups. I think there's some value in this. Yeah. Uh, see, we can work both sides of the aisle here. Yeah, this is great. I love um, this point. Yeah, I think it's good because different groups do have great competencies, um, and th- they need to be valued because, you know, not every culture is able to do the same thing. Um, have you ever played the uh, the computer game Civilization? Yes. So depending on which civilization you choose, they have different things they excel in. And so, like... The Germans excel at making war machines. <laughs> and industry. And industry. They got high industry points. Whereas the, the Japanese, I think, are um, technologically advanced and, like, good farmers or something. I don't remember. They're, uh, they're, um, it depends on which edition you're playing. I've always played three, and so three, it's, I think, uh, they're militaristic, and they're also um, oh, yeah, uh, cultural. Right. So they are, they're religious, and so they have that, that religion yeah. aspect. And so, like, to use the example of a video game uh, to help out here, each culture does excel at different things, and, and that leads to their competencies. So, you know, I don't know what Americans excel at anymore. Uh, it used to be manufacturing. Um, we really excelled at manufacturing. And what did that lead to? It led to things like the assembly line. Mm-hmm. You know, Henry Ford, he revolutionized how all manufacturing worked in the entire world. That's not something any other culture was able to come up with at that time because we had the competency for manufacturing. You know, and, and we were able to offer that to the world. At, at a rate nobody could even come close to comparing. To. Right. Um, that's where the, uh, the, the uh, principal general in um, Japan, before the, the attack in the United States, said, We're going to focus it in Giant because, you know, He's basically saying right now the United States has an okay military. I think we were like <laughs> 70th in yeah. terms of the size or something like that. But then in two years, we were like number one or number two. It was like we were gigantic in terms of our military uh, 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 military increase. Right. Um, and then with, with other cultures, I think that uh, we can reference, we can look over again at, at Japan, um, now that we're speaking of them, that I think that they've uh, accelerated a lot of... Uh, a lot of areas of beauty and art um, and and history and storytelling the uh, the the myths and the poems and the um, modes of artistic expression in Japan are, are are beautiful subtle ingenious and creative and mm-hmm. part of that is because of the territory that they're in because right. Japan doesn't have as many natural resources as something like the United States or even mainland Asia yeah. um, and uh, another thing that came out of Japan which I think has uh, this is where you find some of the greatest expression of uh, martial arts, and yeah. part of the reason for that is the um, when the shoguns came into power, they removed weapons from the common man, and so what, what, what happened? Well, they had to learn how to fight with their hands. Uh, the the in, in Europe, a similar martial arts tradition was um, developing, um, but you could have weapons, you could have a sword, and learning how to punch and kick against somebody with a long sword. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be really worth your while. You need to figure right. out how to use something else. Right. Whereas in Japan, the hand-to-hand, hand-to-hand combat um, and using uh, farm implements as weapons was essential to learning how to defend yourself from yeah. the government. Um, yeah. So it produced these incredible works of art, whether it be in terms of beauty or in terms of self-defense. And I don't know where the world would be without jiu-jitsu today. I'd be less happy anyway. <laughs> yeah, I would too, I'd because be it would mean that you, know, you weren't getting beat up as much. That's true. Yeah. And boy, do I get beat up. You need to be. It's brutal. Yeah. Um, You know, we're looking at getting into some of the other applications of these uh, three values of autonomy, morality, and competence. But we are running out of time because we are incompetent at time management. Um, Hopefully hopefully our conversation really went into some good stuff and and can help those studying... uh, this, this book and this workshop um, but I think taking the autonomy, morality and competence and applying it to um, some of the other uh, things like leadership um, mutual invitation some of the other things within this uh, module would be good I think one thing um, quickly to point out 
in communication styles is um, the difference between yes meaning yes and yes meaning no, because uh, that's different in different cultures. And just a quick anecdote, um, at my last job I had um, uh, an employee of mine who didn't like something I was doing, and they went to the, the, the priest instead of talking to me. Mm. And I said, I, I understand in your culture it's rude to complain to your supervisor about their job. I understand that. But I am telling you that the best way for us to work together and for you to be happy is to come to me directly so we can work out a solution that's mutually beneficial. And um, I think having that conversation was a really good thing to have, recognizing the difference in the culture, but saying, you know what, your yes me- needs to mean yes and your, your no means t- needs to mean no, if I can talk. Uh, because that's a biblical principle, and so it's reaching across a cultural barrier to help form somebody according to the scriptures, which is again the idea of communicating for the sake of charity. Got anything else, Studi? We're out of time. Oh, I wish we weren't. There's a lot of stuff that I wanted to talk about too. Um, you know, I think I think I'm happy here. But if if you listeners out there in Radio Land. Or whatever it is. Internet streaming land. Internet streaming land, the interwebs, which is, yeah, a very large, which I think is like the largest populated country now, if, if we were to count the internet as the thing. Um, or is it Facebook, anyway? I don't know. Um, if you have any concerns, which I know you do, <laughs> questions, comments, um, anything you'd like to have clarified, go ahead and please write to us at lostvoice at wcatradio.com. One more time, that's lostvoice at wcatradio.com, and we will do our best to get to your questions and comments and concerns. For WCAT Radio, and Books and Media, Holy Apostles called the Seminary, and my good, dear friend Jacob Nelson, this is Jonathan Studi signing off. I pray that you earned wisdom today and that you can apply it to your daily life. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.